Hello, everyone. Welcome to the Synergos virtual convening on new leadership for the new normal. My name is Grace Cushman, and I work with the Global Philanthropist Circle here at Synergos, and I'm pleased to welcome you today, um, this morning and evening for some of you. So without further ado, um, today, a quick overview, we'll be speaking first um, with our two wonderful panelists, and then we'll be jumping into these interactive breakout rooms that many of you have already signed up for, and we'll come back together around 10, 10, 10, 15 um, ET for reflections and closing. So I'd like to introduce Marlene Ogawa, who is the acting country director of South Africa here at Synergos, and she will be guiding us through this conversation. Thanks, Grace. Hi, everyone. Um, it's so good to be here today and to um, be part of this amazing conversation. Um, so our two panelists are Dinky Solomon and Robin Alfred. And yeah, today we're going to talk about new leadership for the new normal. And the theme that we're going to focus on is as humanity becomes accustomed to the still reality of life brought about by COVID-19 and the protests and everything else that's happening. Um, many of us eagerly look forward to a time in which we may return to normal. And what is this normal? And yet we will return to many changes that we may experience um, in the system. I think the question for us is, how do we want to imagine and reimagine this new world that we want to go into? And how do we reimagine leadership? And so what does this new leadership look like? And that's what we're going to speak about today. I'm very honored that we have Dinky and Robin. Um, um, so Dinky is a Sonaga's board member and she's been on this journey with us and our founder Peggy um, for a long time. She's uh, also a social activist and very vocal. Um, I've seen some of, um, uh, I've seen Dinky speak a few times, but also seen some of the work that she's done in the Philippines, um, both within civil society and as the secretary of the De Department of Social Welfare and Development. Um, and so I'm excited to listen and hear um, Dinky's story around leadership and then we will also um, hear Robin speak about um, his experience as an organizational consultant and a change consultant, facilitator, trainer, and an executive coach. And I've engaged with some of um, Robin's work and some of the assessment, the leadership assessments that um, they do. And it's very interesting and insightful and very reflective as well. So um, I think I'll stop there and um, ask the speakers to introduce themselves and to lay some of the context uh, in terms of new, new, new leadership for the new normal. Yeah, Dinky, would you like to start? Sure, yes. Uh, good morning, good evening, good day to everyone. Uh, my name is uh, Dinky Soliman. My, my formal name goes by Corazon, which means art in, the, in Spanish, but also in the Philippines. And I'm really a social worker by education background. And as uh, Marlene said, a social activist. And I've had my time in civil society and in uh, government too, uh, serving the Aquino administration as a member of the cabinet. I'd like to share a reflection on what has a new leadership for this time would require. First of all, I think when we say what would be the new normal, I would like to think that normal would not be the word to use because I think that we are in a, in a space where changes are going to happen because what has happened, the pandemic has shown us the inadequacy, the weaknesses of the system that we are all in, both in the economic, political, and social uh, dimension. So the kind of leader, the mind shift, I think, for leaders is really to begin to think as a transformative leader. What does that mean? To me, it means reflecting on my own practice as a leader. And am I 
uh, really going into a situation where I understand what the weaknesses had been of this uh, system and that am, am I as a leader an enabler? Am I empowering? Am I inclusive? Do I have empathy? Those are the elements that I think that are key to make me understand and listen to the different sectors, different peoples I work with, and more especially to groups of people that I want to reach out to. Because I think if I am able to reflect on these points as a practicing leader, then it would then be a way of reviewing too what bridging leadership is all about, which has been a practice that we do here in the Philippines and in the region. Because when we speak of co-ownership now, I think it means really reflecting first of my own practice and looking at myself, as I said, as a leader that's enabling, empowering, and having empathy with other people. And when I look at the situation, to move into a co-ownership situation, it needs to have, I think, a situation of analysis that would be understanding the moment that we are in, where we are in between the old and coming in of a, of a new, a new way of doing things, a new way of arranging our systems, a new way of relating with one another, a way of reimagining and creating a different way of living to be able to understand one another in a more just and equitable manner, but at the same time, understanding to the nature of these relationships were not present in the past. So it's like giving birth to a new order. And to be able to do that, that really means co-creation, but really looking at collaborative ways of co-creating this new system, of doing work with people that you've worked with before, but more importantly, reaching out to those whom you have not had the thought that you could work with. And one experience that we had in this pandemic right now in the Philippines was the coming together of big business, of artists, and when I say artists, these are national artists who st starred in Broadway, that starred in uh, many of our popular uh, movies and songs. They came together to raise funds for urban poor communities and the Philippine Business for Social Progress was the procurement uh, group raising funds and the urban poor organizations were the distributing uh, arm of that effort. And that effort was a relief effort that's a little different because it also linked the rural communities by buying what they had from the rural communities to bring to the urban poor communities. That's an example of collaborating with each other that uh, had not done and had not happened before. But it was because the situation showed that it is important to reach out to people whom you have not had the chance of working before and try to collaborate with each other. So those are my initial thoughts, Marlene, on the kind of leadership that's needed given the pandemic and moving forward. Thank you very much. Um, Robin, your thoughts? Yeah, thank you, Marlene. And thank you, Dinky. It's great to be in this conversation with you. And I just want to start by saluting you for all the work that you do in the, in the Philippines and have done for a long time also and globally too. So it's a pleasure to be in this conversation with you. And yeah, I agree basically with everything that you've said. And I just want to kind of amplify a little bit my, my take on it. And when we talk about the new normal, I couldn't agree with you more that I think the word normal is really unhelpful in a way because normal implies some degree of stability. And my sense is that where we are now and where we've been actually for a while, we just haven't noticed that we've been there, has been in a, in a state of great un instability and uncertainty. And that part of what we need to do now is really build deeper and stronger capacity to be agile, to respond as needed to very changing situations. And it's not as if the virus has suddenly shown us something or has come out of nowhere. 
the virus is sitting on traumas that have been around for a long, 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 long time, for hundreds of years. And Tom Friedman wrote in the New York Times, he said, it's not as if the virus is a black swan, like an unusual occurrence that compels attention. It's more that the virus is one of a herd of stampeding black elephants, which we have ignored for too long. So whether it's the climate crisis or loss of biodiversity or growing income inequality or ocean acidification or international terrorism or rogue states or like whatever, there's been a lot of things going on for a long time. And the virus is just one of those. And, and now maybe there's an opportunity to kind of build more both resilience and agility as, as, as we go now. And for me, part of the leadership that's required now is it starts here, like leadership is an inside job. So you also talked about empathy and, 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 and empowerment and collaboration. And there's a place where we want to reach out and there's a place where we want to reach in. So I think for me, it starts with self-awareness. And I would, I would commend as a practice to anybody who's experiencing leadership at this time to start inside and look at your personal resilience which we could map as your physical resilience, your exercise regime, your diet, you, how, how fit for purpose is your physical vessel, your emotional hygiene. If you experience fear, anger, anxiety, delight, joy, stress, how are you processing that so they don't clog up your system? Your mental agility and you, whether your mind has control of you or you actually have control over your thinking like which way around is that and to, and to develop a practice for the mind and also your creativity, like how connected are you to your creative stream? So for me, it starts with personal resilience, like looking at me, how am I doing on those levels? And within that, and that in itself requires a practice and it requires some spaciousness. And in a way that would be the thing that I'd want to pause longest over probably is spaciousness because in the space, we can create self, not only self-awareness, self-awareness is part of what we can create when we notice what's happening so that I'm not caught in reaction, I'm more generating appropriate responses. So it starts with the inner work, which I know is a very important part of, of bridging leadership. So it starts with our inner work, but then as part of the inner work and the spaciousness, we might then notice more and more things. And one thing we might notice is that the future, and this I'll go more into in the breakout session, the future is actually whispering to us all the time. So it's not as if we need to sit here and think about what we need to do. My sense is more we need to sit and create the inner conditions of receptivity to listen to the future. The future is kind of, it's, it's broadcasting all the time. There's like an FM station called Future FM, and it's kind of broadcasting all the time, but most of the time we don't hear it because we have a plan and we know what we want to do and we've got a strategy and we've got budgets and we've got timelines, we've got deliverables, and we've got KPIs and we've got all that. But actually the future, future FM is broadcasting all the time. And if we can listen and we go, oh, that's what I'm called to. So it's not so much that the future is something we walk towards. It's more the future is already landing in us if we allow it. So I think part of the leadership that's required now is the spaciousness to digest our experience, to notice what's driving us, and to listen to the whisper of the future that is calling us. And then, of course, we need the courage and all the things you talked about, the courage to build unlikely collaborations, to be empowering, to be inclusive, the things that you've mentioned, they then come from this kind of deep well of presence and wisdom rather than kind of habits from the past that we just throw into tomorrow and call it the future. That's not the future. That's just a recycling of the past. The future is actually fresh. The future is innovation. The future is new possibility. And that we can access if we listen deeply enough. And last thing I want to say at this point is when we listen deeply enough, we might also sense ourselves part of a bigger movement. So we might sense ourselves part of a global interconnective being in a way that the virus on one level kind of shows us, it knows no borders. We have a global economy, we have global travel, or we used to, but maybe we also can start to birth a global consciousness and maybe organizations can start to birth a planetary purpose 
but something beyond my individual purpose, my organizational purpose, etc. We start to see ourselves as part of a bigger movement. I think when we slow down and sense the bigger rivers that are carrying us also. So that's my initial take on this question of leadership and, and, and the current situation we're in. Yeah, thanks Robin. Just as you said, emotional hygiene, I felt like taking a deep breath in. And I am going to ask all of us to just, whether it's morning, afternoon, or evening, I think we've probably been running around. So just to take a deep breath in and out. Yeah. Thanks. Thank you, Robin. Um, Dinky, you said something about understanding the moment. Um, what do we have to do to understand the moment? Yeah. Robin spoke about space, and I know you've sp spoken before about liminal space. Um, yes. What do we well, need to do? Well, first of all, um, Richard Rohr had said, uh, there is now, we are in a liminal space. Liminal space is when we are between the old and the new. It's like you're in between and usually it is when you change jobs, someone dies or you, you change uh, uh, your way of life. And we are all now in a liminal space, so to speak, because the old ways, as Robin had said, is showing us its limitation, its weakness, its inadequacy. And therefore we know the future, as he says, there are whispers, but do we listen and hear enough of that? So I think what we need to do is be comfortable in this space and be creative and reimagine. What would be a way of working with one another? What, is, what would justice be for us now? What would uh, an economic system that would help the many impoverished communities in different parts of the world because I think this is part of what the challenge we face, that as a result of the system of uh, old, many people, and because of this pandemic, it increased, loses jobs, uh, are in the, on the verge of hunger, are in very dire situation of uh, poverty. And this is part of what I think we need to reimagine a system where they will have a quality of life uh, that uh, makes sure that their dignity and their needs are you know, responded to. But that would really mean an overhaul of the system, of leadership, of the way we govern, of the way we do our business, our economic systems, which really have to start with listening to the future as Robin said. I mean, how do you uh, craft that? And we craft that, I think, by listening to each other, but more importantly, making sure that the voices of the marginalized, the voices of those who had been victims of injustice be heard, because they would be able to tell us how they see a future that uh, is just, that is equitable, that is sustainable, and that would be giving them a quality of life that is good for all of us and not just for a few. And I wonder if I can pick up on something that you mentioned there about the, the, the voices of the, the marginalized, if you like, and the voices of the people who experience injustice, because I think part of, part of what I would say is understanding the moment is about understanding what this moment is composed of. And sometimes we look at something and we see it on a surface level. It's like the iceberg. We see the iceberg, we see the top of the iceberg, and we think, oh, that's what this moment is composed of these particular challenges, these particular gifts, these particular opportunities, these particular circumstances. But underneath it, under the surface of the water, there's like nine tenths of the iceberg is there. And I think we sit on fields of both individual and collective trauma that in a time like this become more apparent. I mean, if you just look in the United States at the moment, what's happening there isn't about the death of, of, of George Floyd. It's, it's much deeper than that. Of course, it sits on hundreds of years 
of oppression, of slavery, <clears throat> of the civil rights movement, <clears throat> of the genocide of the American Indians. It sits on, on all these other traumas. And I've done a lot of work in communities around the world trying to do kind of eco-village developments. So one thing that when I live in, a, in an eco-village in Northern Scotland, so an attempt to build a sustainable human settlement. We're part of something called the Global Eco-Village Network. We go and do kind of eco-village development in Africa, for example. You can't do it until you've addressed some of the trauma because you sit in a room with people and probably nine out of the 10 women in the room have been sexually abused. And this, this, is, part of, this is part of our kind of normal is that we expect, and we, maybe we don't really know how to go into it, but I feel like we, we need to acknowledge, we need to become a trauma-informed society and our organizations need to be trauma-informed and we as leaders need to be trauma-informed because trauma is shaping our, not only our responses to the world, it's shaping our views of the world. It's shaping our world to a, to a significant degree. And when we start to look at that, we start to understand what the moment is actually composed of. It's composed of some surface responses to a situation, but those things sit on, on layers and layers of individual trauma, of collective trauma, of cultural trauma. You can't work in Germany, for example, without understanding the nature of the Holocaust and how that is still rippling out through German society. And that's just a very contemporary example. So, so somehow I think we, we, as leaders, we need to take responsibility for moving from trauma creating culture to a trauma informed culture to a trauma healing culture. And that's just a, I just wanna bring that into the conversation because otherwise I feel like we're a little bit on the surface of what, what the reality appears to be, but it sits on layers and layers and layers that we also need to excavate. And, and just to build on that, if I may, Marlene, and yes. the healing really means addressing the injustices that uh, Robin had uh, mentioned, and, and that's layer upon layer in different societies, in different uh, uh, contexts, and in different cultures. But there is a common, uh, a common element there, which is that of oppression, that of injustice, and the trauma that they've, they've gone through and the healing will have to first uh, take the step of acknowledging the trauma as uh, Robin had said or acknowledging the injustice and therefore the corrective measures must be undertaken within the context of, of healing and that's the only time I think that we can think of a future that's inclusive and I think as leaders the, the challenge is to be able to facilitate processes that will bring that or surface that into the open. Because, uh, because as Robin said, it's not, sometimes it's something that you don't want to even discuss and you don't even want to confront the victims themselves. And that takes some time and that takes a lot of uh, skill. But then I think the leaders must be able to find processes that will uh, bring bring it out and, and articulate and uh, have that converse, that difficult conversation, as we call it uh, here uh, in our context, have that difficult conversation. Why did we divide ourselves between the current leadership and uh, the other leaderships that we could have chosen? We need to discuss that and understand where each other is coming from. Yeah, absolutely. And, and as, as you say, it takes courage to do that. It takes courage to create the spaces to, to voice one's own experience, but also to listen and to witness. And I think another practice for leaders is what I would call global social witnessing practice. Mm -hmm. So that we can, we can, as I said earlier, we can start to feel ourselves part of a global community and we can start to develop a global consciousness. And part of that means having the capacity to host somehow internally global realities as if they were our own. So I don't kind of look and say, oh, that's happening over there. And isn't it terrible what's happening in India or in the Philippines or in South Africa or in the Congo? No, I feel it as me and I witness it and I host it. Now hosting and witnessing are, are quite fine arts. Like when I, when, I, when I listen to the news, I can listen to the news and go, oh, it's really terrible. Uh, let's have another cup of tea. 
and I'm not really present with it, or I can listen to the news and become overwhelmed with how shocking and terrible it all is and just feel like I'm in deep distress. But somewhere in the middle, so I can either in a way kind of be hypersensitive or hyposensitive, a bit like insensitive to it, but somewhere in the middle, there's a range where I can witness and host what is happening and feel it enough and, and host it. And sometimes we need to do these things collectively because it's hard to host these things on one's own, but to host it so that I can generate from that point, what is my response to what I'm now hosting more fully? So I don't just have an intellectual knowledge about oh, the percentage of people who are experiencing X, Y, Z. I feel it and I can also host it. So I think those are kind of, these are also kind of very fine arts of leadership. And leadership to me, it's not a toolkit, it's a set of practices. So I would also encourage people to practice witnessing, practice listening to the news in a connected way, for example, and just notice what happens inside. Do I numb out? Do I disassociate? Do I get overwhelmed? Or can I be present to it and then listen enough to know what is my response to that? Yeah, thanks. Thanks for that, um, Robin. Um, yeah, I think what you are both naming are some of the characteristics that we need for the new kind of leadership. So I'm going to ask, because I believe the wisdom is in the room, um, for um, our participants to share in the chat um, some of the characteristics they see are key for new leadership as we're emerging into this new or different and, and as we're transforming and going through this liminal space. Um, and I'm, I'm just curious to also um, hear um, what for, for you, Robert, and for you, um, Dinky, what is the, like the one thing, if you were to choose, I know it's a mix, and in bridge, bridging leadership, we look at um, the different elements required for, um, for leadership to, to be uh, impactful. Um, just what's the one thing for you that you see as key in, in leadership or one phrase that you um, would share? Because we're soon going to go into the breakout room, so we'll keep it short. Robin, why don't you start? Well, it's very hard to find one thing, but I guess if I was asked, as you have asked me to prioritize one thing, I would say something like deep inner listening. Like, the, like, and that's, that's also about spaciousness, like cultivating, becoming gardeners of space, cultivating spaciousness within ourselves so that we can really listen deeply. And from that place, we can sense both the bigger movements and our place within the bigger movement. Mm -hmm. For you. me, it, it, it would be comfort in uncertainty, that you can live and act as a, Robin had been sharing with us, it, that, that you're emotionally affected, but that you can act and you can do something positive. So it's, it's it, in a way, it's what the liminal uh, space is saying, that you, you can actually be comfortable in the uncertainty because you know you're about to give birth to something new. And that may not be very defined in the, in the future, but that you're you're actually building the future as you're as you're acting, and uh, I really like the term list whispers of the future, because that really means you're you're being conscious of yourself and others. Yeah, thank you very much. Um, so we have a couple of responses in the chat. Uh, Nazir says new leadership requires the ability to detect and embrace uncertainty. Yes, mm -hmm. and make decisions informed by uncertainty. Um, and thanks for that reminder um, that it's okay not to know, but to be curious. And Carla says open-mindedness um, as a characteristic. So we're going to move into the breakout room, but I would ask people to continue to, to respond. Um, I'm sure you are all familiar with um, breakout rooms um, and we try to make sure that based on your pre-selection that you have been put because we have um, we ask people to select which breakout room they would like to go into and um, 
so linked to the conversations the speakers just had, Robin is going to um, take you through a process of listening to the whisper of the future. Um, and he's going to sh um, explore how leaders um, can lead from the future and what is it that we need to do to um, prepare ourselves um, to be and open ourselves and give, us, give ourselves the spaciousness uh, to be able to listen from the future. And Dinky is going to talk about reimagining leadership in the new context and, um, you know, to think about and envision and dream about this um, leadership that we want to see. And, and, and um, I'm learning so much these days about what is it that I need to do as a leader in my space. So I think for each of us and in the work that we do in the world that we are, what is it that we need to do and influence um, where we can. Wow, we suddenly leapt out of a very deep conversation in our breakout. Wow, I was so so great. So I'm sorry, I just want to say to Max because he was just in full flow. So apologies, Max, that we we've been we've been pulled back into the magnetism of the. Of our... <laughs> it's okay, understand. There were other people wanting to speak, but I'm sure that was the same in Dinky's group too. Oh, what great conversations we had. That was awesome, um, such insights. Um, so Grace, do you wanna share um, from Robin's group? Um, like Robin said, I think that we, uh, in any breakout session that we end up getting into, we can always use more time. And I, I think we have some time to maybe continue that conversation a bit. Um, and I'd also love that to continue that conversation in future conversations um, at another time. So in this session, I think we really had the pleasure to discuss how to listen to the whispers of the future. And we started initially with a short kind of brief dialogue as a group really touching on how we have to learn how to respect where people are and how to make space for the wounded parts to come forward and really acknowledge them. And, and then we entered into a really a lovely reflective practice of, of creating inner space with Robin. And, and he led us through this opening of ourselves to really understand what that means to, to listen to the future. Um, and I think I would have loved to just continue to do that for the full 30 minutes as well. Um, and then we really came back together to discuss how to create that space and what it means in individual practices to allow presence and inspiration um, and for the future to arrive and enter our beings, which in longer practices, Robin compared um, to the birthing of a different level of consciousness, I believe, Robin, I, I think I might be quoting you there. Um, and I would love to turn it over to him after we hear a little bit about your group, Marlene, um, to kind of round out anything that I might have missed. Oh, that's a great summary, Grace. Thank you. And I just want to also bring forward the, the a voice that was also in our in our group saying you know we can focus on trauma or that in a way had a challenge to how I had framed the trauma piece which I also think I want to acknowledge and saying yeah there's a trauma and there's also a lot of resilience and there's also a lot of power and there's also a lot of capacity and that we want to kind of balance those and I think it can also be very painful for in in, in parts of the world where there's an identification with, with the trauma and the victim status, or we can give that to people and say, oh, these poor people over here, or these poor people over there. And actually there's a need to also really acknowledge the power and the resourcing and the resilience in those communities. So just to kind of bring that, that as a balance also. And I don't think it's one or the other, I think it's both. I mean, we want to acknowledge the power and resilience that's there and we want to say, yeah, and sometimes we also don't look enough at the, at the trauma that kind of skews the foundations on which we're building so just to bring that voice present also um but i i thought it was a great conversation that yeah like you say we could have done with another hour or two to really deepen into the practice and also then unpacking with the fruits of the practice but it was great thank you and thank you grace for your summary thanks robin so i'm going to summarize and then um dinky you can add um and i'm kind of choosing where I'm starting because it was so insightful. Of course, uh, Dinky put um, 
new leadership within the context of social justice. And so my personal reflection as an individual, Marlene, who I am, just that it is hard to talk about. Um, there's this, and, 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 and so I think my question is what's the brave, safe spaces we continue to create to, create, to talk about um, social justice issues. Um, but um, Joey spoke about, um, so as we were talking about new leadership, what I heard is we need to, um, so new leadership, how we've been speaking about it, Talon also spoke about, you know, it's like we want to change ourselves as leaders and how are we creating space for, for new people to come in, the emerging leaders, and what's the space that we create and the support that we are giving them to, to, to take up this role in leadership. And Sally spoke about, um, you know, just how we're seeing leaders, community leaders, stepping into the role that they have to play and um, playing that role right now. And how are we supporting them as organizations, as individuals of people with um, voice access how are we allies to those leaders? And, and, and the recognition that, um, uh, you know, um, Henry said leadership needs to be redefined. You know, how are we, we defining it? Where are we looking for it? How do we see it and, and how we support it? So um, uh, we, Shelley also reflected on liminal space and, and uh, really the external influences and how do we allow ourselves to be influenced from the inside out? Um, so what's the work we have to do from the inside to perhaps listen to the future and create that space to, to do so. And, and of course, lean to what's the space that we create. Um, also, how do we, how do we um, empathize? How do we show compassion? And what's the work we need to do within that to, to, um, to show empathy and compassion um, from a place of trust and building trust so that we can, so people know that they can tap into us um, as trusted people to have the difficult conversations. I think that was also insightful. Um, uh, not because I don't know it, because I, I work in the, I'm in the work, but it's just a reminder as well, um, you know, and, and, and so I, when Joey was talking, um, I think part of the question is also, and, and what is what what is it that we are doing um, to 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 create space and to support emerging leaders, transformative leadership? And when we think about diversity, equity, and inclusion, um, how do we um, how would how do we build leaders? How do we hold them when they have so much that they carry? As, as young people coming from diverse spaces. And when we reflect on um, what's been happening, we see that where there's enough diversity, there's also a lot of successful, impactful uh, uh, um, leadership that, that emerges and leadership that, that happens. Yeah, I'm gonna stop there. And Dinky, I don't know if you want to add. Okay. Well, the, the only thing I, I'd like to add, I thank you for the very uh, comprehensive summary. I think what was also brought up uh, uh, by Henri was the, when we look at the leadership right now at, on the political sphere, the women leaders have shown um, a different way of uh, uh, responding to the pandemic and that it, it, it is, as uh, Henri put it, like the yin and the yang approach, that it is not uh, one uh, track, uh, you know, strategy going this, that way. But it is more of uh, looking at the situation and responding to the situation in both efficiency and compassion coming together. And that I think was very important. As part of what new leaders can do now in the, in the, in, in the future that we want to build. So that would be what I'd like to add. But thank you, that was a very comprehensive summary. Thanks, Dinky. How could I forget women leadership, of course. <laughs> uh, yes, thank you very much. Um, so are there any further reflections, uh, Robin and Dinky, that you want to share based on the sessions? And yeah. I would actually love to hear from anybody else on the call who's, there's a lot of wisdom in this group. So I'd love to hear mm -hmm. any other perspectives from the call. I don't know about you, Dinky, mm -hmm. but I, I feel like they've heard enough from us and it would be great to hear from them. Yeah. Yeah. Someone's talking here. Yeah. 
while people are thinking. Um, someone's talking about Thomas Hubbell and he's got, um, he speaks about collective trauma and does collective healing as well, which is also what came up for us in That's terms right. of collective action. Yeah. Bobby, is your hand up? Yeah, please. Um, I just wanted to, uh, I actually forget what the exact quote is, but I've been reminded this whole session, um, the, the great Sufi poet Rumi, uh, who said something, I mean, somebody on the call will probably know the, the precise quote, but, uh, but it's something like, uh, if you want to change the world, first go change yourself. Yes, thanks, thank you. Those are the kind of the words that are sitting with me right now. What's mine to do and what's the change that needs to happen within me, by me? Yeah, thanks. Marlene, yeah, uh, yes, Kiran. Uh, uh, well, thank you. Uh, you know, uh, I, I'm part of a fellowship called Initiatives of Change. And uh, we, you know, ask ourselves certain questions quite often. Uh, while thinking of various issues and problems in the world, am I a part of the same problem or am I uh, part of the answer? And uh, it helps to reflect, you know, on uh, really what role am I playing in the concerned issues? And uh, many a times it calls for some change, you know, like I have to first change myself if I want to address that kind of an issue in the world. It may be hatred, it may be anything, you know, like that, corruption maybe. So I just wanted to share uh, that, that sort of a outlook which uh, we learn in initiatives of change. Thank you. Thanks, Kiran. Yeah. Anyone else? Um, I forgot Dan Daniela's point, which I always say, um, she was saying we, be we need to begin to model the kind of leadership that we want to see. And I always say it's like all these tenets, it's muscles that we have to flex. And, and, and so she was saying, if you do it over and over again, some of the, the good qualities, um, you know, that they begin to stick. Um, and so what's the modeling of these? Yes, Daphne. I wanted to ask a very practical question. Um, um, I wanted to ask if you are able, how can we contact you uh, to be able to, to do this same um, the dynamic with Chilean people? Um, because I believe that um, the, the way you go inside and it's very, how to say, wise. And I believe that's the way we, we're going to get to different places, going inside and receiving inspiration. Um, uh, that's a practical question. How can I contact you for, to, to, to invite you or to work with us with Chilean groups of people of, of leaders who I, I believe that um, in, in Chile people, they, they learn more from people from the outside sometimes uh, than from the same people <laughs> they're in. Yeah. So I, I, I believe it would be a great thing to have other people like, I don't know, Robin or, or Corazon being invited to our groups to share in like in a professional way that that's a very practical question thanks we'll we'll share robin's contact uh, contact details and dinky's contact details as well um for yeah further discussion and engagement and i'll be coming with robin to chile um i think um <laughs> i wish uh, uh, no i'm just kidding <laughs> i'm dreaming <laughs> I'm having a dream of coming to Chile. And <laughs> to come and, and uh, first, perhaps with this pandemic, we can organize something. Like I am, I'm a director of a, a foundation, but more than that, I've, I've worked on, on human development and I, I've done myself 
and in the work. And I believe that's the only way to like to see our own shadows and, and for us to dialogue in a better way. But I believe yeah. I need also ali aliados. I need aliados, <laughs> people to to say to be the same, to think the same. Like in the in the meetings we have, like there are not many people thinking like that we have to get together with the heart and feel and that the yeah. the answer is from mind and hard to be together. So I need people who also can talk that, not only me, because I'm a little bit, uh, sometimes I look like a... You're on your own. So you need allies. Um, yes, to, yes, I need yes. allies. <laughs> I'm just on a very practical note, as you asked a practical question, I can definitely send you some links of people who also will offer this in Spanish, which I imagine would be more helpful. Yeah. And yeah. there are currently some calls that are happening like once or twice a week for people in the fields that I'm part of, which are holding a space in Spanish for this kind of a, a practice. So I can definitely send you links about that. Thank you very much. Yeah. Thanks. And, so, and also, Daphne, and, and also, sorry, I'm Alejandra and I'm representing part of Synergos in Chile. And I'm, I have now not a very well connection, so I'm not, it's not my face in the, uh, in the screen. But uh, we are working, Daphne, so you have access to all the contacts from Synergos. And we are looking that with Marilia and Daniela um, 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 this week. So uh, be uh, calm, you have the contacts. Huh? Thank you. Thank you, Alejandra. Nazir, um, has his hand up? I, as I was um, reflecting uh, on all the wonderful thoughts that were expressed here, um, one thought that came to me is that an important part of leadership is really followership. Uh, mm -hmm. We need to really, I think, um, we have grown up in cultures historically with structures, and that's where you know Trix's point about power and resonance really. Uh, struck me that, uh, you know, we have grown up in structures of strong hierarchy where we expect others to solve the problem. Sometimes we also have to just really listen a lot more and observe a lot more and take cues from others. And I, I think all of us who are sort of see ourselves in roles of leaders, I hope we also think of ourselves as followers and not followers of those above us, but followers of those with us and around us. Thanks. Yes. Thanks, Nazir. Trixie, um, I see your hand now. I was just saying, yeah. is this poem, oh, am I not? Sorry. Um, yeah, I have this poem that I quoted a little bit on the chat. If I may, I just read it out because it's exactly about the followers and it's called The Contract. And it's a word from the lead. And in the end, we follow them, not because we are paid, not because we might, be, we might see an advantage, not because of things they have accomplished, not even because of the dreams they dream, but simply because of who they are. The man, the woman, the leader, the boss, standing up there when the wave hits the rocks, passing out faith and confidence like life jackets, knowing the currents, holding the doubts, imagining the delights and terrors of every landfall, captain, pirate, parent by turns, the bearer of our countless hopes and expectations. We give them our trust. We give them our effort. What we ask in return is that they stay true. Amen. Thank you so much. Thanks for that, Trixie. That was great. Wow, and I'm checking- So amazing my... because that's written by William Ayotte, right? Exactly, that's... exactly. Yeah. Yeah, he's, a, he's a friend of say... mine, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Thanks. Did you say you're going to paste it in the chat or share the link? But we'll find I, I wrote it. It's a little bit of William Ayotte. Yeah. The, the poem is called Small Things That Matter, the book. Okay. Thanks. So just before we close, any, um, any message thoughts um, that our speakers would like to leave us with? And also just, um, yeah. A deep sense of gratitude for everyone um, and, and the wisdoms that you shared. So, yeah. 
Thank you. If you want to go. Yeah. yeah. Well, first of all, thank you, everyone. It's been a very uh, enlightening and very, uh, very, very uh, insightful discussions that we've had. And I just thought that, you know, one of the most important elements that we have been, uh, I've been hearing is that we really need to build on our own understanding of our own self and our own uh, weaknesses, our own strengths, and sharing that with a community of people who believe in uh, the moment that we need to change and that we need to transform. And that what we really need to do at this point is build solidarity, build uh, what we call trust networks so that we can actually take the moment of liminality and really give birth to new forms of uh, systems of justice, of uh, way of loving one another in a just and uh, comfortable way with people whom we have not been comfortable with in the past. So that would be my thought at this point. Yeah, thanks, Dinky. Thanks. And my, my closing is, first of all, also to echo your uh, appreciation. I really enjoyed the conversation and would love to have uh, more connections with, with everybody on the call here. So I hope that we'll continue to stay connected. Um, I, have, I have three thoughts, really. One is we can't do it alone. So the coming together in circles like this, what I experience as a circle, even if it's a flat screen, like coming together and dialoguing together and supporting each other is essential at this time. I think it's essential at all times, but maybe particularly at this time. So, so I really appreciate also when people say, I need support, I need allies. I think that's really essential. So what is our sangha, if you like? What is our group that, that, that we can journey with and create spaces to share deeply? So that's, I think, essential. The other question that I would invite you to ponder, that I often ponder for myself, is the question, what am I responsible for? Mm. And that might sound like a small thing, but it's actually, if I think, if you really go deeply into that question, for me, it surfaces quite a, a, a rich inquiry. What am I responsible for? There are some things that I'm not responsible for that I might care about, but what am I actually responsible for? What is my responsibility? And then to fulfill that responsibility with courage. And the last thing I would like to do is also just read a little, a little uh, word or two from Mary Oliver, late great American poet. And she writes about this, which I find very moving. And maybe it's a, it's a note that I would like to close on. She writes, I would say that there exists a thousand unbreakable links between each of us and everything else and that our dignity and our chances are one. I would say that there exists a thousand unbreakable links between each of us and everything else, and that our dignity and our chances are one. The furthest star and the mud at our feet are a family, and there is no decency or sense in honoring one thing or a few things and then closing the list. The pine tree, the leopard, the river, ourselves, we are at risk together, or we are on our way to a sustainable world together. We are each other's destiny. We are each other's destiny. So I want to offer that as a closing for me. And thank you so much. I really look forward to seeing you all again. And thank you, Dinky, for sharing this space. It's been a delight. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, thanks, um, everyone. Um, I think, Robin, what you are really um, emphasizing is the ethos of Ubuntu. Um, you know, I am because you are, and we are together in this. Um, so um, just from my side, really thank you for the team. Um, we have a production team who works behind the scenes, so thank you very much. And for the conversation and just sharing your deep wisdoms, everyone, um, your questions and the thoughts and for engaging. Yeah. And, We'll share the link and, and, and I think through our team, you can connect with each other as well. Um, link to the video and um, definitely another conversation around this. Um, I think if we create the space um, that's safe and brave, then we can have deep, meaningful conversation. So just thank you very much from my side. Um, I don't know if there's anything else um, 
And thank you for staying on past your time. Thanks, Robin. Thank you, Dinky. Really appreciate it.